Okay, once again, it's the physics video lecture. T Psi 168 video lecture 23. So last time we did the butter candle. So we're ready to, well, I'm gonna review the butter candle and I haven't had a chance to look at everybody's notes yet. So I'm hoping you did it. And if not, go ahead and make one, take a picture of it, include it in your next set of notes. We're doing thermal physics, the butter candle taught us what the calorie is. So let's do a quick review of thermal physics up to the present point and we'll move right on. I like talking about this progression of ideas. And then show us where we've ended up so far. Okay, we have hot and cold sensations. and associated phenomena, for example, thermal expansion. Which brings us to thermometers and temperature scales, where we make this, uh, this when we talked about the sensation here, that's more subjective. But when we bring it down to a temperature scale, we have an objective measure of things. So uh, temperature thermometers and temperature scales. And in fact, we had three temperature scales. So we had Fahrenheit, we had Celsius, and we have Kelvin. So those three temperature scales, and these two are the ones we're going to use in physics. We can use any temperature scale we want, but all of our formulas and concepts are tied in very nicely with these here. Good, so what we did last time was look at heat and the calories. cartoon I like to draw for this. So here on this stand we have our beaker. Underneath here we have our butter candle. In here we have water. And we say that in here. There we go. So we have water in here. We have a butter candle heating the water. Temperature increases and we say that one calorie heat, whatever that is, to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. Okay. So you really want to know what this calorie is, and this uppercase C calorie, right, so, so we have calorie equal 1,000, oops, that's not equals 1,000 lowercase c calories, but this is the food calorie. And does everybody remember, does everybody remember how much water is a kilogram of water? The volume of that is a liter. So we have a perfect idea of what's going on here now. And with this definition, you could know how much fuel you need to raise the temperature, say, of a barrel of water, a bathtub full, from one temperature to another. Because, you know, one calorie, that'll raise temperature of one liter of water by one degree Celsius. You have 100, liter, 100 liters of water, then you need 100 calories, okay. For one degree Celsius, you have 100 liters of water and say you want to raise it up to boiling or something, which is basically 100 degrees from 20, then you need the appropriate number of calories as well. So you can already calculate your energy needs since we had fuel. And uh, the butter was just an example of fuel. We had the heat of combustion. Okay. So, and I think this is what we ended with. Uh, 
combustion, and I'm going to have you look some of these up later, but first we have to make a little progress here. So heat of combustion, and we had um, fat, and I should say that's fuel, has nine calories per gram. I'll write it out so you know what the gram is. And then there are other heaps of combustion as well. Okay, so here's what comes next. What is the relation of this to the set of energy concepts that we've been talking about all, uh, prior to this? I couldn't say all semester we spent so much time doing geometry, right? But anyway, we've been talking about energy, and what's the connection of this idea to energy, which is force times displacement? So what we'll call this now is heat and energy. There was, there's a time, and this is where the word calorie comes from, where it was thought that heat is a sort of a fluid that can flow in and out of a substance, and the fluid was called the caloric. But Joule is in fact the name of the unit of energy that we use, and along with some other workers, made another discovery about heat, and that's actually, you know, it should have been there all along. It's actually as simple as rubbing your hands together and feeling them get warm, okay? Rub your hands together, they get warm. Or suppose these are sticks here and you rub them together, right? And you somehow make fire. So friction, we can create heat through force and friction. And in fact, if I'm bearing down on this here, this is a stick, right? I'm bearing down on it, working back and forth, that is a force and there's a distance. You can even measure the distances on the ruler and the force would be how hard I'm pressing. So the frictional force generates heat. Okay, rubbing the force, the frictional force, uh, we call it energy dissipation, it generates heat. So, so the next thing here is friction and heat. And there are so many examples of it, but the idea of just rubbing your hands together or rubbing two sticks together and, and starting a fire, that's not that easy, but there are ways to do it, okay? So we have friction and heat, and so let's just write down these examples. You know, if you rub hands together, as we say, or fire with uh, rubbing sticks together, that kind of thing. There are many cases where friction generates heat. Actually, if you just slide down a slide on the playground and the seat of your pants warms up, that's also the same thing. So there are endless examples so that it makes it surprising that uh, the early physicists were thinking of this caloric fluid. It seems like friction would have been right there staring them in the face. Nonetheless, these discoveries have to be made. Good. So what I'm going to then show you is the Joule churn. Are we still numbering things? Yeah, why not? Why not? So here's what Joule did. to actually use the definition of the calorie. Remember, we're talking about raising the temperature of water. So what he did was he found a way to generate friction in water and raise the temperature of the water. I'm going to ask you guys to find some images. I'll do a rudimentary picture of the jewel churn right here on the board. So he churned water. You've heard of churning butter, churning milk, and turning it into butter. So let's draw the jewel churn. There is some kind of barrel here, and there's a handle that you can crank. Okay. 
So you can turn this handle and inside, let's use another color just for fun, just because we can. Inside there are kind of these paddle wheels. Okay. So you can imagine you're turning the handle on this thing and these paddles are spinning around and they're churning the water, you're, there's resistance so you're actually doing work, right? Work and energy. So there's water inside. And Joule then has to create a very sensitive thermometer. I'll just put it right here. So they can turn the handle, do work, and increase the temperature of the water. So in order to make it uh, objective. You know, how much work did I do when I turned this handle? What you can do is put a spool here. I'll use red again. You got string around here and you run it over a pulley which is mounted somewhere. And I'll just say you've got a mass of, of uh, you got a mass. Okay. And let's even draw our H here, because we always associate the amount of work done with MGH. So it's the same as with the grandfather clock. There's a weight, it's going to fall, turn the jewel churn, and as a result of that, the temperature of the water is going to increase. Okay. Easier to describe than it is to do because, the, of course, the temperature of the panel is also going to increase. You've got to subtract that out. You're really just interested in temperature of the water increasing. So we have work MGH is converted to calories. Okay. And the way it work it happens is that there is friction. Friction in the water, there's just a resistance to turning that handle. Okay, so that's the Joule churn discussion, and I'll give you the result of it now. But yeah, go ahead and see if you can get some good images of this, maybe some discussion of it. The idea is right there. Yeah, so what is the result? The result is what's referred to as the mechanical equivalent of heat. Okay mechanical equivalent of heat. So, so and so many joules of work were done as this weight descended. How much heat was produced? That's the big question. And uh, that's the result of these experiments. So let's go ahead and just put that down. It's just going to be a single number. And then we will put it into context. So the result of Joule's experiment, Joule churn experiment, that's an M, good, so what is the result? result is the following. One calorie is equal to 4,186 joules. Okay, very careful work there. One of our calories whose definition I just erased, but we know what it is. One kilogram of water, one degree Celsius, 4,186 joules. And this is referred to as the mechanical equivalent of heat. This will be a guaranteed question on the final. What's the mechanical equivalent of heat? Okay. And all kinds of stuff around it. Good. This fantastic result. So let's discuss it a bit. This is just an equality. It allows us to actually stop talking about calories from here on out. We 
you could just talk about joules. Instead of a soda pop can having a number of calories on the label, it could just as well have a number of joules. But I like to retain the idea of the calorie um, because this equivalence is so important. Namely that a certain amount of work turns into a certain amount of thermal energy. So let's, uh, oh, and, and one more important thing on this picture. We know this equality in a sense, we know it in this direction, okay? In other words, if we do the work, we can raise the temperature of water, right? We did the work and the water increased in temperature. Now, if you could do the other direction, as we can, then you'd really be living. Because if we could turn fuel into work, why that would be a heat engine. Okay? That's a later topic in this in this semester. But for now, we just know that you know friction work produces heat. Good. So how much is 4,186 joules? I always like to use this example. It's possible that I did it. It's, it's possible that I did this earlier in the semester already, but this example is always good. It's the stair climb. And because the numbers work out so well, if somebody has a mass of 80 kilograms and climbs five meters of stairs, then what do we have there? We have 80 kilograms, roughly 10, right? 9.8, 10 meters per second squared, and five meters. And that is that 800 times five equals 4,000. And that 4,000 is close enough to 4,100, okay? So 4,000 joules. So for example, if I were sitting, if, you know, if this were me here, and the rope went down five meters, and there were one liter of water in there, then its temperature could go up by one degree Celsius. That puts some perspective on how much work has to be done I think Joule must have had some very accurate thermometers. He wasn't getting large temperature differences. Okay. These things are hard to do in practice, but in principle, they're easy to discuss. So yeah, the stair climb, that's always a good idea. So now we know that that five meter stair climb is a one calorie stair climb. Our body uses more than one calorie because uh, it's doing a lot more than just climbing the stairs, right? Keeping your blood circulating and everything's functioning. Um, and that takes energy too. So we'd have to look up, I think that, you know, I think that stair climb would be in terms of food calories, several, several food calories, depending on who you are. But yeah, that's a, an important example of what 4,000 joules is. And our later goal is going to be to reverse the direction of the arrow and somehow find a way to burn fuel and get useful work out of it. Okay. But for now, we know that uh, we have this direction. Okay, I'm going to consult the clock here. Okay, very good. Yeah, go ahead and Get some pictures, that one's not that bad, but get some pictures of this jewel churn for your notes as well. So in terms of our energy discussions, we will, from now on, just be able to talk about joules and not calories. So what I'm going to do next is uh, continue this discussion. And the next thing to talk about is different substances, right? Up until now, we're just tied to water. OK, 
okay? But water isn't everything, so we have to talk about thermal energy in terms of other substances as well. Okay, let's see. We're still numbering things, huh? Let's call this nine. Actually, that was nine. We'll call this ten. So this is my example. And so for this example, I'll introduce this cartoon. We're going to use the letter Q for thermal energy, and we're going to just say what happens when we add thermal energy to an object. And right now all we know is the temperature goes up. So this is an object mass M, and this new letter C, which is called the specific heat capacity. I'll just write specific heat. Okay, so the idea is this could be a torch, this could be us rubbing our hands together, it doesn't matter. It's a certain amount of thermal energy, and it raises the temperature of this object here. And the formula that's going to go with that mass times specific heat times the change in temperature. The, the change of the temperature in degrees Celsius. So let's write all of this out with M equals mass, right? It's going to be in kilograms. I'll write the delta T first as the change temperature, and that's going to be in degrees Celsius, and this letter C here is called the specific heat capacity, the specific heat capacity, and we always have to know the units, okay, so now if we look at this equation, this is energy, these are joules now, these are kilograms, these are degrees Celsius, so we're just going to solve for the letter C. If we solve for C and ask what are the units, then it's Q divided by M times delta T. And if we ask what those units are, joules as a denominator, kilograms times degrees Celsius. So those are the units of the specific heat capacity, joules per kilogram degree Celsius. I have to stress that because I'm going to have you look some of these up and you'll find charts with different units because it can be done in terms of calories, it can be done in terms of Fahrenheit, you know, so it can be done in terms of different units. The ones you guys look up have to be joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So specific heat capacities, I'm going to start a little chart right here. Um, So let's put a couple words here though. When heat is added to a substance, the temperature increases. That's what we're talking about. When heat is added, Whatever form you do it, and the temperature increases. By the way, if heat escapes, then you can say the temperature decreases. That's the opposite of this here. Right? right? This delta T could be negative as well as positive. But we're thinking about adding heat to something right now. And so the first one we want to know, so let's call this specific heat capacities. We're going to use these units, joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And here's the first one we have to know about, water. 
and you do water, well, that's the only one we know. Because we know if we have one kilogram and one degree Celsius, we know that that's 4,186 joules. So if these are ones, and this is 4,186, then C is 4,186. So for water, it's just, uh, I'll write the letter C here. Why not? C equals 4,186. And again, joules per kilogram degree Celsius, very important. Interestingly, ice has a completely different specific heat capacity from water. So actually, I have to put a little W there because they're both water, right? This referred to liquid water. Ice is half as much, 2,090. And what I'm going to ask you guys to do, get at least four more. Let me tell you what, what we want to have here. We want to have a couple of metals. You're going to be surprised at how small some of these are. Turns out that water has the highest specific heat capacity. That means you can add a lot of heat and have a very small change in temperature. Okay. So what else should we get here? I think, uh, We'll ask for glass and uh, copper, steel, lead. Glass covers a lot because rock will have uh, similar specific heat capacity to glass. So I've given you two of these, and you want to find some specific heat capacities. Again, in joules per kilogram degree Celsius, find at least these four, four more. You can, you can find more as well. Get at least a half a dozen of these because it'll give you a good overview. You'll be surprised how small the specific heat capacity is of lead. Okay. You'll be surprised. Okay, so go ahead and get those. And yeah, this is a really important cartoon and concept here. Simply that. Temperature changes, we knew that already, um, but the degree of temperature difference is different for these uh, various and assorted substances. And when you fill out this chart, you realize it's substantially different. By the way, air has a specific heat capacity as well. So maybe you should extend this here, seven air and eight water. How about, well, we already have water, don't we? So at least air. This can be interesting if you need, you want to know how much fuel do I have to burn to heat up the air in my house and uh, the walls of my house and so forth. Okay, you consult the clock here. topic I'll get started on. Actually, this is a good place to, this may be a good place to, to stop for the day. Get the heat capacities. I want you guys to, yeah, this is a homework. Look some up and fill them in. Actually, I'm just going to set up what we're going to do next time because it's a good place to, to break right here. So I'm just going to write here next. What happened?
happens when you have a substance and you just keep adding thermal energy to it? Okay. Let's write that down. What happens when energy is added to a substance? What I'm driving at is that there can be a change of phase. Okay. Let's write here change of phase. So we're going to do this in detail next time. But for now, I'm just going to do go with the cartoon. We can start with a block of ice. So we'll write ice here. And we take it out of the cold, cold part of the ice, ice box. And so we add energy to it, it's still ice. It's still ice, but it's changing temperature according to that formula and this specific heat. But eventually, we bring it up to zero degrees Celsius and it melts. Okay. So it will eventually melt. And then where well, there was ice before, there's now a beaker of water. And we can now heat the water and heat it some more and heat it some more. Eventually, here I'll draw a little balloon. There's going to be water vapor in the gas. So that's referred to as change of phase from solid to liquid to gas. And in each of these, we're always adding thermal energy. Okay. And we'll also talk about next time what happens. The other direction works as well. So if you put all this energy in, then it must be true that if you uh, go from gas back to a liquid, energy is released. And if you go from a liquid back to a solid, energy is released. That's going to be our topic next time. Good, so let's leave it at that, and we'll see you later.